Hello and welcome to the official podcast of Palate Exposure, featuring Alona Thompson, a podcast for those seeking the ultimate in wine, food, and travel. Each week, she interviews winemakers, chefs, celebrities, and a variety of guests that shape the way we enjoy life. So I'm, I'm here with Don Katz, and um, many of you know him from Pats and Hall Days, uh, which is a very established, um, very beloved brand. And he, um, rather than after the Pats and Hold was sold, um, rather than doing something else, um, he decided to create multiple brands that are exceptionally intriguing, and we'll talk about all of them. But I'd like to start at the beginning, like a very good story, there should be a beginning. So today we'll get to know Don on a personal level. We're going to find out where he was born, where he went to school, his first kiss. All the good stuff. <laughs> I'm definitely not going to do that. Oh, I, I'm so going there. Um, <laughs> I think it's really important for people to get to know you. I've been very fortunate. I've known Don for many years and tasted many great so bottles with him. If we're going to do this, you have to call me Donald because Donald, I'm sorry. Only, only people. Pe- only people that I knew when I lived in Minnesota get to call me Don. Uh, and you actually asked, you requested this before, and I've neglected to honor it. Uh, <laughs> you, you'll figure, you can hear in my voice that I have a cold, so let's just say that I got to my brain too, because I really meant to, to recall that properly. I apologize to start over and call <laughs> you by the name of Donald exclusively from this point on. No problem. Um, so we're here with Donald Pads. Um, who is you don't founding. have to start over again. No, it's okay. You can use it and then you'll just translate, <laughs> trans, transition the into it. The founding partner of Don Passon Hall and um, very interesting story there because for those of you that paid attention to Passon Hall um, and his capable um, tutelage, it grew to quite a prominent brand and really iconic for many uh, for Pinot Noirs and Chardonnays from the New World. Um, and um, again, rather than taking it easy after the brand was purchased, he decided to launch a multitude of brands, which intrigued me to no end, and I happen to know a bit of an inside story, because he was generous enough to invite me to the cellar and barrel taste and, and tell me what he's up to, but this exercise is for the purposes of enlightening you guys who are either aware of the brand, are fans of the brand, or origin fans and I think it's really um, important that you get to know Don as well because I'm privileged to call him as a friend Um, and over the years I've gotten to know just how extraordinary um, his mindset is and it all starts there you need to know the maker in order to know the wine Um, and he's the kind of person that really is very thoughtful and deliberate about everything he does and it all came from somewhere so we'll start in the beginning We'll start with the way he grew up and what that was like and what influences he had during that period of time. Yeah, well, certainly no influences with regard to wine. My parents were teetotalers and um, never drank beer, wine, or distillates when I was growing up at all. Um, but I was, strangely enough, born in Fargo, North Dakota, huh. which is Siberia equivalent of that. <clears throat> and. Uh, I was only there briefly, only about as long as it takes to be born in it. My parents really were from Minnesota, so we ended up living in Minneapolis. I lived in Minneapolis, in the suburbs of Minneapolis, until I was going into uh, middle school. So big impact of growing up in the upper Midwest, uh, real um, work ethic and also educational. The parents that were living there at the time really took education seriously and I can't remember starting a school year without a lot of brand new books every year it was really wonderful and the transition from there to moving to Oregon when I was going into ninth grade was really kind of shocking because um, it was not the case and not that the parents I think it's not that parents there didn't take education as seriously it's just that they weren't prepared to spend the same amount of money that the equivalent people in Minnesota were for their kids education and I don't think that my education suffered, but it was really an interesting transition to see. So I lived in 14 years in um, near Minneapolis, and then 14 years to the day that we moved to Oregon, I left Oregon to move to California. And I was specifically interested in being in the wine industry. I went, um, I moved to Santa Rosa, but let's back up a second. I actually finished high school in Eugene, Oregon, and then um, went to the University of Oregon 
and got a degree. I was a pre-med student and got a degree in biology, uh, which has stood me in pretty good stead in the wine industry. But for the end of my um, end of my time at the University of Oregon, I was part of the pre-med honor society, and that farmed you out to doctors to see firsthand what doctors do each day, and gives you a chance to. Uh, to experience a little bit of what their day, day is like and see if you are up to the challenge. And so the first day that you would work with one of these doctors, they would, you know, they'd, they'd ask you a bunch of questions about what you were doing. The second day, you get to ask a bunch of questions about what they were doing. Third day that, that, that you were walking around with them and observing, the question comes up, you know, well, what else are you interested in, Donald? And I'd say, you know, I'm kind of interested in wine. I, I think wines are really fascinating subject and I enjoy sharing it with friends and the historical and geographical stuff is really interesting to me and every doctor I worked with got that sort of dreamy-eyed look in their eyes and said yeah someday I hope to have my own little vineyard that would be a great way to you know finish my career and I after having been declined to go to medical school the second time I said you know, maybe there's a more direct route into the wine industry than having to go to medical school in order to be able to afford to do it. So at that point, I, I started looking around for other jobs. Worked in as a uh, rep for a distributor for a while in Oregon before we moved to California in, in 1983. And so, uh, yeah, that was been, that's been, that's a quick and dirty history of, of Donald Patz from, from the time he was born until we arrived in California. California was really for me, I wanted to work for a winery. I was interested in this. At this point, I could have chosen, because I have a degree in biology, I could have said, I really want to be on the winemaking side. But I already had a child, and I knew that they got paid nothing. And unless you were the actual winemaker, being a cellar rat, pulling hoses and stuff, paid barely minimum wage. So. On the other side of the ledger, if you were in char if you were de doing sales, you actually could make a reasonable living. And so I chose to be on the sales side, not because that was my real passion and being in the wine business, but because it just was fiscally responsible as a parent. Um, but I stayed very active in the production side of stuff at Flora Springs when I first started there in 1985. All of the uh, partners were involved with you know making decisions about winemaking. And that's where I met this fellow, James Hall. James went on to become the winemaker at Honig. James and I started talking about, you know, what our dreams and, and future plans were after he left um, Flora Springs. And uh, it occurred to us both that we were sort of thinking about doing the same thing. And we got together and said, hey, let's, let's try doing it together. I don't think either of us, and then eventually became our spouses as well, I don't think any of us thought that this was going to be a super long-term project. Maybe, you know, five or five or six years or maybe a little longer. And then who knows what was going to happen. But it turned out to be a 30-year gig for me. Um, almost 30 years anyway, from the time we started Pats and Hall in 1988 until we sold it in 2016. So 28 years, 29, 29 harvests. Um, and focused exclusively on Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, if you know anything about Pats and Hall. Uh, it was a it was a wonderful run, and um, you know at the end of that, when we sold our our winery to Saint Michel, um, I was offered a one year contract, as were all the partners, and so I continued on in a transitionary sort of position where I was helping them to understand what we had done and how we had gone from nothing to something, and uh, at the end of that, uh, we were sitting around. It was a, almost exactly this time. Um, two years ago and uh, had a meeting with the guys from Seattle and we had a very cordial meeting at the end of which I said to them tell you what um, you don't have to pay me anymore if you just give me a release from the next two years of my non-compete and they agreed to that which was kind of a sensational moment really mm -hmm. I mean big corporations rarely allow people out of contracts but this was I thought a real gentlemanly thing to do and I really appreciate it. They were very fun to work with. I liked the guys there and I would have said this whether or not they released me from the 
I think the wines that they're making are interesting and fun, and the Washington wines especially I was really admiring. So it was great. I got a full release as of May 1, 2017, and hit the ground running looking for, th for new things to do. So that's kind of the brings you up to what the heck is he doing with three different brands? It does, and I... I'm very interested in every detail of that, but I want to hit the time machine for a second um, because you had such a significant history with Bradson Hall, and that's not the focus of our conversation. However, um, you have built a very successful brand, and I find it really enlightening that you didn't start out, as you pointed out, with a passion for sales, yet you became exceptional at it because to grow the brand to that size in the span of 29 years is pretty unbearable. So I want to talk about that back in 1988 when you first launched, and I'm sure it was a little scary. You both had families. You had children. Um, what happened? <laughs> what, well, what happened? Uh, well, the first year um, was 1988, and we had more wine than we thought. Originally, our plan was to make about 200 cases worth of Chardonnay, and we were looking for a grape source. And, um, and the reason we chose Chardonnay was, a, was for a couple of reasons. One, we actually like drinking Chardonnay. And two, um, we realized that, uh, you know, there was a market for it, that there was, in fact, people out there who liked drinking Chardonnay as well. And three, we didn't have to hold it for two years. You know, we had, we had uh, resources we felt we could do um, if we could make the wine and sell it you know, in a re relatively short period of time, we could turn the crank and actually make this um, ongoing, which is which was the the whole point of Pats and All to get it up and running, and then it, hopefully it could be self sustaining as soon as possible. We just didn't have the means to dig deep and make um, a long term commitment to it because we just didn't have the money. So the point was um, make the wine, sell it starting September first the next year, and we made the wines with that in mind. Uh, not that we didn't think that they would be ageable, but we wanted to make sure that they were drinkable at an early stage so that they would be saleable. So what do we do? Well, it was a different time in the wine industry. You know, 1988, when we were starting this, the super rich extracted uh, Chardonnays were the rage, and uh, we were certainly influenced by that. So the, the wines that we made at the very beginning for Pats and all 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, probably at least, were very, um, very ripe, very extracted wines with uh, quite a bit of new barrels. And the idea was to, you know, create wines that we knew that people would like and that we, we liked drinking them too. And at the time, um, it was sort of the thing. Uh, you'd have been crazy not to consider it. What we were doing was adding, there were a few people that were doing this already. I mean, I guess there was like two wineries that I really kind of looked at um, as we were getting started and enjoyed their wines prior to that for years. Kistler and Shalone, and now Shalone is a pale shell of what it was back then in, in terms of the quality of their wines, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But uh, those were really intense and um, powerful wines uh, back in the late 70s and early 80s. And uh, that really influenced me. Also, the single vineyard designates from Acacia really influenced me, although a slightly different style of winemaking. So <clears throat> we looked at those, I looked at those, and, and sort of used that as a template for how we wanted to present the wines to the market. And we started off with a Napa Valley Chardonnay, and it was all barrel fermented, all surly aged, 100% ML, um, a, a style of wine that I still find very attractive. But Definitely riper, thicker, richer style at the beginning than probably we did closer to the end of our our run with with Pats and all because it was the style it was the style of the day and so we we met that style and and launched it into the market. So how oh and like I said we were prepared to do about 200 cases. We got a call from our grower that year, 1988, from John Caldwell, and John said, "Hey, I have some extra grapes this year." And uh, I don't know where it's going to go, but if you're interested, well, we'd be happy to uh, front you these grapes 
And then, you know, if you like the wine, we'll figure out how you can pay for it later. And if you don't like the wine, um, I'll just, I'll pay your crush costs and you won't, we'll just take the wine away. You don't have to worry about it. So it seemed like a ridiculously good deal, right? Really good offer. Yeah. So it sounded great to all of us. So we all jumped in we went from about 200 cases that we were planning to do to um, almost 500. So from two to 480 or 490, I forget exactly what the, what the number was, um, that first vintage. Regardless, um, it was about this time <laughs> in 1989 that uh, James Hall and I and Ann Moses and my now ex-wife Heather Patz we're all tasting the wines together, um, tasting the barrels because it was one wine, but there was, you know, multiple barrels. So we like tasting them each as many of the barrels as possible. And uh, James said, I think we have a problem. And I'm tasting the wines and going, I don't have a problem. Look at how good this wine is. It's really going to be fun. And he said, no, I think we have a problem. The problem is that we had a budget for 200 cases. We just made 500. Oops. That does seem so, like a marketing problem. It's more of a budgetary problem mm. because we didn't have the money to bottle it. Mm. So we we're in a, you know, we're looking at this and going, well, this is really good. We don't want to get rid of it. Maybe we can, you know, bottle part of it and then sell that and then bottle the rest. Bad idea generally because the wine that you bottle later is going to be significantly different, potentially even oxidized. So we all sort of kicked around trying to find a, a source of short term cash that would help us to bottle it. And I couldn't come up with any. My parents weren't interested in investing. Um, I didn't have any friends, you know, could just write a check. So James finally decided to go to his father, and he convinced his father to loan us the money to bottle the wine. Mm -hmm. So we he loaned us the money. We bottled the wine in August. We sold out of the wine before the end of October. Collected all the money and paid him off in December of that same year. I think he was like one of the most shocked and surprised persons before Christmas to get this check that basically uh, he thought he was never going to see the money again. He figured he was just throwing it away as a to humor his son in his crazy pursuit of the wine industry. So there we were feeling really good about it. But um, and how do we do it? So it was a really different time. You know, yeah. there's such a proliferation of brands now and that it's it's hard to really understand um, the difference in the market. There was eagerness on the part of distributors to find a new brand, or particularly a new brand that would focus on something that they thought they could sell, like Chardonnay. Yeah. And uh, so, and we had experience with that. I'd already done, you know, four or five years of um, Flora Springs at this point, and it. I knew the distributors. I knew the, some of the distributors I wanted to work with. I didn't choose all the same distributors. Um, I wasn't working so much in California, so it took us a little while to get California rolling with Pats and Hall. But yeah, it it was. I think the main thing is was that it was a different time, and we had something that not everybody had. There was a there was a different style of Chardonnay that was sort of predominating back in 1980 in the mid 80s. There was either partial barrel fermentation or stainless steel going into barrel. And only a few people were really doing complete barrel fermentation. And let alone malolactic, which for many years was considered to be a spoilage organism in white wine, um, as opposed to something that would add complexity. So we had, a, we had a, a style of wine that I think was ready for the moment and, and off we went. And a similar kind of thing happened with with Pinot Noir, I think. Um, when we got to Pinot Noir in 1995, it wasn't because we didn't want to do a red wine, it's just that you know we were kind of humming along with Chardonnay and trying to figure out what the next step might be. And there was that moment in the mid-90s where it was clear that something was going to happen with Pinot Noir. There was so many new clones becoming available, so much replanting because of uh, phylloxera that um, really allowed growers to rethink what was proper in their particular place. A lot of the Pinot sites went away in Napa um, and in some of the warmer parts of Sonoma and were replanted with other varieties, primarily in Napa with Cabernet, of course, but in other places, Merlot and Bordeaux, other Bordeaux varietals. So Pinot moved quite a bit further west in Sonoma and uh, much cooler sites. And I, I, th I think we all just sort of looked at each other inside Patson Hall and said, something's going to happen. We can make Cabernet in the Napa Valley and be 
a little fish among a bunch, a bunch of big fish in a big pond, or we can do something with Pinot Noir, which we also loved, and um, and be a small, you know, still a small fish, but there's not other, a lot of other fish around, so we had a chance to, to make a splash, I think, sort of mixed metaphor there, but um, yeah, so in, in, in a lot of ways, 1995 for us with Pinot Noir was a lot like starting off with um, Chardonnay, although, of course, we had an established market for Chardonnay by 95, and so Pinot Noir was a much easier transition into than starting a, a brand new project would have been. Yeah. So it, it's, there is no secrets here. I mean, <laughs> it's really easy to say, and I appreciate it, that somehow or another I magically created something out of nothing. It was just grind away hard, hard work. I mean, I routinely was up late at night worrying about this stuff and writing letters and doing st everything I could possibly think of to bring attention to the Pats and Hall brand. And then, um, you know, slowly but surely, like the little, you know, the the little tiny motorboat trying to pull a Titanic. You you work at it long enough and the Titanic will actually start to move and eventually um, we went from there to single vineyard wines and did all kinds of fun stuff within Pounds and Hall. It was a wonderful time. Well, a lot of people possibly would be disappointed to hear that there's no shortcut, but what you just described as a grind. Um, as you said, with proliferation of brands, but also proliferation of people that are attempting to influence the marketplace. And it's not a good cocktail often because it, they create an illusion that it replaces hard work and dedication and the dogged pursuit. Um, because on the surface, when you look at Pats and Hall, it's incredibly successful and you had so many vineyards that are highly sought after in your portfolio and your price points eventually got to where they were you know, really blue chip wines that people sought after. Um, so the funny thing about that is, you know, when you're working on it on a daily basis, it's really difficult to see that from the inside. Yeah. <clears throat> the wines sold through, but it's not because we did, you know, there, it wasn't because there were no bumps in, internally. You know, as you go along, um, sometimes sales flag on something and you're, you know, there's a lot of con concern. And at one point I can't, I'll, I'll never forget this. I was, uh, we were sitting in a meeting and, um, and we were talking about, we were making Durrell Vineyard Chardonnay at the time for, for Pads and Hall. And there was some concern that the Durrell Chardonnay sales hadn't been as fantastic as we'd hoped they were going to be when we first released that vintage. And I forget what vintage, it was probably early 2000s, probably 2000 or 2001. Um, and so I said in the meeting, I said, <laughs> I'll tell you right now what's going to happen because we're worried about this. We're going to start talking about it to everybody and then we're going to get a really great review from somewhere, I don't know where, and it's going to sell out in a fairly short order. Um, I was just talking. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have any insider information that that was going to happen. But of course, in fact, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. We got like a 94 point score on the wine and bang, the phones lit up and away it went. So, What was your toughest moment? Toughest moment? I think the tough, for me, the toughest moment was um, early on where, uh, especially that like 1989, where we had sold the, at the end of, or early 90, we'd, so we'd sold the 88 vintage in 1989. The government decided we made money, which didn't feel like we made any money, but uh, apparently the government thought we did. So they demanded taxes, which none of us had the money to, to pay. So. I actually converted a life insurance policy in order to be able to pay taxes in 1990. And that was one of those moments where you say to yourself, man, I don't know. This isn't very much fun. Every time I turn around, there's some other hurdle to jump over. Now it's taxes? But we got past that and off we went. You know, and then there's, like I said, there's bumps along the way. Anytime you're in business and you have a partnership that goes on for a significant period of time, like 29 years or 28 years, the, um, there's, there's rough patches along the way. But uh, I think we were all dedicated to making the very best wines we could and to delivering them to our friends in short order. <coughs> what made you stick it out, though? Well, it's, <coughs> it's, a, it's really satisfying to see... Um, to hear from people that, that they're enjoying your wines. The conclusion of this interview can be found in the next podcast, already available for your download. 
Thanks again for tuning in to the official podcast of Pal Exposure, featuring Alona Thompson.